Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be speaking to this assembly. Uh, by a show of hands, uh, who here has read Meditation on Moloch? Okay, and who here reads Unsung? Okay, so some of this will make sense to some of you, that's great. Um, I am here uh, to talk about implications of Moloch, and specifically what I want to um, talk about today is uh, the weird clothes. I, um, I uh, suppose I can, I can give a brief background, a um, life in three pictures. This here is um, uh, the gentlemen with their hats on fire are my brothers. I grew up in a very, very Chabad family, and I was Chabad until 14, when I read philosophy and became an atheist. Uh, this is me at university debating the Christian society <laughs> on the lawns, um, and this is me last year leading an interfaith war. <laughs> a teenager marching. <laughs> yes. This is a local Australian teenager leading war. Um, so I think, like, to, to most rationalists, this transition is very familiar, whereas this one is generally met with, like, a sad tilt of the head, <laughs> maybe a shake for the fallen. And um, I, I, I guess I have enough genre savvy to recognize how utterly crazy I appear, uh, both here and in general. And I figure here I can sort of give some accounting of myself. I thought a lot about what to include and what not to include because it's I'm trying to squeeze a heck of a lot of content into a small frame. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is not so much uh, deal with the uh, ritual side of things, like why individual ritual activities have value or merit, um, but rather deal with the um, the broader uh, ideological underpinnings of things, like how it is that one can be um, ideally intellectually honest, and I'm hoping that a lot of you will keep me that way, um, and maintain a, a religious garb and religious activity. So um, the question I'm really uh, here to address is the Ali Foss question. Some of you may be familiar with the passage from Unsung. I recognized Elliot Ellie Foss, calm, quiet Elliot. Erica had picked him up at a Unitarian meeting in Oakland, picked him up in both senses of the word, well, two of the three. She hadn't literally lifted him. <laughs> Rumor had it that he was actually religious instead of meta-ironically religious, <laughs> but no one could tell for certain, and the whole idea made us sort of uncomfortable. <laughs> and I've had this experience for uh, a year or two now where I just walk into rooms and I just feel everyone getting vaguely uncomfortable. <laughs> and I really want to say something about it, but I notice you're vaguely uncomfortable. Mm. Could I talk to you about my religion for a while? <laughs> <laughs> Tends not to make things any better. Uh, so we really, um, this is, I suppose, my first attempt to really uh, lay it out as honestly as I can. Um, this was the blog post that changed it all for me. Uh, Meditations on Moloch was reported by a lot of um, uh, people, including a, um, a very dear friend and prominent Slash Star Codex organizer in Sydney who wishes to remain unnamed, um, as a transform transformational experience. People read like 25 pages of blog and then they're like, yeah, wow, life is different. <laughs> and then you ask them why, and it's like, well, you know, it's the vibe, it's the, the fighting and the, the bollock and such. And I, I've done a lot of thinking about this blog post and I think I can um, sort of get a bit closer to um, the heart of why it's so remarkable. Uh, if you haven't read this blog post, I recommend you do. Um, I'm not going to go over the arguments there in great detail. Uh, and really, if this is if you're watching this on video, I, I recommend you pause now, go read the essay, and then continue. Uh, but the ba very, 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 very compressed form of it is um, that the uh, opportunity to throw values under a bus for a temporary advantage um, is always open. And that that, in fact, is the, um, the, the sacrifice of throwing one's children into the fires of Moloch. And that so long as that option remains open, it will uh, prove irresistible. I'm, uh, I don't think that's enough to actually get the gist of it. So again, please read it. Um, 
what's remarkable about the um, about the appearance of, of Moloch, um, especially when Scott talks about having a mystical experience and seeing Moloch, is that uh, it doesn't fall under what you might conventionally think of as an egregor. An egregor, uh, says Wikipedia, is an occult concept representing a thought form or collective group mind, an autonomous psychic entity made up of uh, and influencing the thoughts of a group of people. The symbiotic relationship between an egregor and its group has been compared to more recent non-occult concepts of the corporation as a legal entity and the meme. Uh, I think egregor has a bit more punch to it, which is why I've chosen this one, but yeah, um, legal entity, meme, corporation, uh, several Jungian archetypal ideas fall here, um, but the idea that, that gods can function by, um, by this principle of egregor is a very old one and not particularly novel. So, um, for instance, simply the fact that the city of Athens uh, worships Athena, the idea that they have in mind a warrior, uh, a, a warrior who is wise as their goddess, and serve the warrior who is wise as their goddess, keeps their minds focused on issues of war and wisdom and, and leads to the flourishing of Athens. This is kind of an easy one. It's a freebie, um, as far as I can see, because um, it doesn't go anywhere near as deep as Meditations on Moloch. To sort of illustrate this, I'm going to go to uh, Uriel's Kabbalah, which is um, outlined in, I think, chapter 44 of Unsung. Uh, I think it's a remarkably well-made uh, structural analysis of the universe, and um, the the words used really correspond very, very easily to real-world simulation uh, mechanics. <laughs> Oriel tells Sohu, we distinguish among four types of Kabbalah corresponding to the four worlds. The theoretical Kabbalah corresponds to the world of Atsilas. It is the analysis of the form of Adam Kadman. This form is untouchable, and the slightest change to it will probably destroy the world. Uh, this corresponds very clearly, to my mind, to the mathematics, the structure of the world itself that is unchangeable. Uh, the next line is... Yes, below this, corresponding to the world of Bria, is the celestial Kabbalah. This is the manipulation of rules by which the form of Adam Kadmon produces effects in the physical world. It is the form of Kabbalah which I use to run the universe. Uh, that corresponds very much, to my mind, to the physical um, uh, laws of this universe, physics as such. So already we're moving away from the abstract um, mathematical uh, untouchable truths into the continued truths of our particular universe. Next, below that, corresponding to the world of Yitzhira, is the applied Kabbalah. This is the manipulation of lower level concepts and archetypes. So. Uh, here we'll have uh, concepts and archetypes such as the, um, the uh, Jungian archetypes and later the uh, archetypes of Joseph Campbell in uh, his uh, work on the Hero of a Thousand Faces. Um, higher level uh, conceptual entities like uh, the United States or, uh, for instance, McDonald's, but I repeat myself. The fourth <laughs> level, the world of Kabbalah. Any human can master it once the appropriate names are known. That's the, the stuff. That's all this stuff that's going on right now. Uh, it corresponds to this lovely rustic scene. Now, what's um, interesting about this set to me is that a lot, of, uh, a lot of the arguments you tend to see about religion, which would use some sort of schematic of this, would be sort of jumping between Asiya and Yitzira. You'd be making a case something like, well, you know, Athena isn't real, but she's real in Yitzhira, like America, and therefore she does stuff, and therefore the goddess is real. Which is great, and I think it's a perfectly adequate uh, justification for a heck of a lot of religion. But, um, I don't think that Moloch is there. I think that what Scott has demonstrated in Meditation on Moloch is that Moloch is here. He emerges as a function of game theoretic inevitabilities. Which means not just that Moloch exists in our world, not just that he um, would exist on other planets, but that even in uh, other conceivable universes, anywhere where there are independent agents um, competing, he would emerge. Uh, I mean, the simplest form of this is anywhere with biological life, since evolution itself is his playground, would produce Moloch. 
And I think that's, that's the real um, oomph at the center of this essay. The real thing that hits you and stays with you is that uh, Scott has demonstrated the existence of this fell god at the deepest and most fundamental uh, level of reality. So from there, there's um, a, a bit of a, a, bit of a uh, sidewind, I suppose, to Scott's idea of getting out of the car. He um, has a beautiful piece uh, called Universal Love, said the cactus person, where um, he is on ayahuasca, I believe, and is arguing with a cactus person and a big green bat who just want to keep telling him about how um, important universal love and transcendent joy are. And he's trying to convince them to uh, give him the prime factors of an immensely large number. Essentially, if they could do that, it would provide evidence that uh, these beings were real outside of just the fantasies of people who were very high, and therefore that they should be taken more seriously. Um, later on, the, uh, the big green bat tells him that it's very, that, um, we're running around time, sir? No, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, later on, the um, big green bat tells him that, uh, to imagine that he's in a car, and that all the prophets and mystics and sages throughout history have told him that the really, really important thing to do is get out of the car. If you get out of the car, it'll all make sense. And what you keep doing, the big green bat says, is you keep turning on the headlights in weird orders or driving backwards along huge amounts of highway. And you keep trying all this stuff and trying to figure out like how to get out of the car. But the reality is it's something really, really simple and utterly unlike anything you've done before. Um, this and a whole lot of other stuff that Scott says leads one uh, down a bit of a mystical road. I, uh, my, my primary meditative training is in um, Vipassana, but I have also, as any good Slate Star Codex fan, dabbled in a bit of psychedelics. And I've experienced um, at various states in various ways what it means to get out of the car, to stop being invested in the particular, um, so here we get into, here we get into um, I suppose, unproved metaphysics. But uh, one gets a sense as though one is um, removed from the particulars of, of one's uh, body and self. One gets the sense that one is um, at one with all things. And that, that sense uh, really resonated with me on a religious level. It felt very uh, similar to things that I had experienced as a child of faith, um, and very unlike anything I've uh, experienced in the intervening years. And um, I, I uh, found this passage from Blake from the Marriage in Heaven and Hell very um, pertinent here. He said, The prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel dined with me, and I asked them how they dared so roundly to assert that God spoke to them, and whether they did not think at the time that they would be misunderstood and so be the cause of imposition. Isaiah answered, I saw no God, nor heard any, an infinite organic or perception. But my senses discovered the infinite in everything, and as I was then persuaded, and remained confirmed, that the voice of honest indignation is the voice of God, I cared not for consequences, but wrote. Um, this is in uh, Blake's, as I've said, uh, Marriage of Heaven and Hell, and we actually have it on canon, from the word of um, Neil Armstrong himself, the man on the sphere, that William Blake was right about everything. <laughs> so, taking this, um, idea really as serious as I can, the idea that the voice of honest indignation is the voice of God, keeping that fixed and letting everything else, all the other pieces of the puzzle move around it, the idea seems to be that conscience is the, is the fundamental force that opposes Moloch. That that which arises in people who say, hmm, this isn't to my advantage, but in some sense it's still the right thing to do, that is the, the, the independently arising force that keeps um, chipping away at the demon god. And it arises independently everywhere in the world, and, it, and it's described by the mystics in uh, varying like surface level language, but on a, in a deep sense, I think, when Lao Tzu talks about the Tao, and when Buddha talks about Dhamma, and when, um, when uh, we of a more Western persuasion talk about God, at least in the purest senses, we, we're going at the same thing. We're going at the, the sense of oneness that informs uh, profound and radical moral action. Um, it's made, I think, more explicit when, uh, this is again from Meditations on Moloch, 
this is from a Twitter feed of things that a certain um, D and D player is no longer allowed to do. My favorite so far is my paladin's battle cry is not allowed to be good for the good god. <laughs> But Scott points out that he thinks this is an excellent battle cry. Um, and in fact, the Amida standing prayer that I was raised on as a kid, the, the most sacred prayer in Judaism, which is recited thrice daily by some of the faithful, um, contains something very, very uh, linguistically close to that. Blessed are you, O Lord, whose name is good, and to whom it is fitting to give thanks. Now again, if we hold that stable, and that everything else, all the other pieces of the puzzle move around it, we suddenly have, I think, a uh, far more coherent theology than most that I've come across. Uh, and in conclusion, I think that this shouldn't be a, um, uh, an arbitrary or um, hypothetical issue. I think there's a very, very serious uh, quest, the Peveril family quest, currently being plugged away at, at California, um, we, many of us, uh, receive the quest from uh, the great Elias Yudkowsky or Scott Alexander or the various other disciples who carry what I think of as very much the true faith. Um, and the, the ray it's given in, the, uh, in Harry Potter and the Me Methods of Rationality is, I am Harry James Potter Evans Veras, the son of Lillian James of the House of Potter, and I accept my family's quest. Death is my enemy and I will defeat it. And here we have a very, very straight line between the author and the text. Because Elias Yudkowsky's life goal is to defeat death. Machine Intelligence Research Institute began as a fantasy and coalesced into something very real. And um, I think regardless of, of how the particulars of it pan out, the fact that we had an ideologue of that vision in California at the right time we may never understand how important that is. Uh, and I think that that is the center of it for me. Because um, Isaiah 25, 8 says, he will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord Jehovah will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the reproach of his people will he take away from off all the earth. For Jehovah had spoken. So here it is for me. Beneath issues of metaphysics and poor reasoning, beneath um, disputes of whether it's worth uh, standing in the face of howling nihilism if, it, if the cost is um, the denial of scientific fact. I, for one, think that um, we, enemies of the paperclip, <laughs> together with all enemies... We did not death, coordinate that at all. <laughs> we did not coordinate that at all. Oh, wait a minute. You were sitting there and you did it. Okay. <laughs> we, enemies of the paperclip, together with uh, all enemies of death throughout the world, have one and the same quest, the Peveril family quest. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Thank you. That was really good. Really appreciate it. Who is the Peveril family? Um, should I, 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 should I